Welcome to Achieve Wealth through Value Add Real Estate Investing. This is the show where the guru hype is banned and you get direct insights from commercial real estate operators. If you're a passive investor, this show can help you better understand investment opportunities. And if you're an active investor, the lessons from each episode can help you to become more effective in your own deals. Now, here's your host, investor and author, James Kandasamy. Hey listeners, this is James Kandasamy. Welcome to Achieve Wealth Podcast. Achieve Wealth Podcast focuses on value at real estate investing across a different commercial asset class. And we focus on interviewing a lot of uh, operators uh, so that you know I can learn and you can learn as well. So today I have Omar Khan, who has been on many podcasts, uh, but I would like to go into a lot more details into his underwriting and uh, you know, market analysis uh, that he has. So Omar is a CFA, uh, has more than 10 years uh, investing across real estate and commodities. He has like, experience in the M&A transaction worth $3.7 billion, syndicated large uh, multi-million deal across the U.S. And he recently closed 130-plus uh, something units in Jacksonville, Florida. Hey, Omar, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you, James. I'm just trying to work hard to get to your level, man, one of these days. (laughs) That's good. That's a compliment. Thank you, Omar. So why not you tell our audience anything that I would have missed out about you and your credibility? (laughs) I think you did a good job. If I open my mouth, my credibility might go down. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's good. That's good. So let's go a bit more detail. So you live in Dallas, right? I think uh, you're your, uh, I mean, if I've listened to your other podcasts or we have talked before the show, you came from Canada to Dallas and you yeah. bought, I, I think you have been looking for deals for some time right now and you recently bought in Jacksonville. Can you tell about the whole flow in a quick summary? Oh yeah, well, the quick summary is, man, that, uh, you know, when you're competing against people who want to, who want to, whose operating strategy is a hope and a prayer, you have to look a lot. <laughs> Right. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, and hey, just to give you a full disclosure, yesterday there was actually a smaller deal in uh, Dallas. Uh-huh. It's about 120 something units, uh-huh. and I mean, we were coming in at 10 point some million dollars, uh-huh. and just to get into best and final, people were paying a million dollars more than that. Uh-huh. And I'm not talking just a million dollars more, as in I was trying to be cheap, because the point was, at a million dollar more than that there is freaking no way you could hit your numbers like mid teens IRR eight to 10% cash on cash. Like literally they would have to find a gold mine right underneath their apartment. Mm -hmm. So my point is it's, uh, it's kind of hard, man, but what are you going to do about it? Right? Yeah. Yeah. You have to keep looking. You have to keep finding, you have to keep being respectful of brokers times, get back to them. I just keep doing the stuff. I mean, you would do it every day pretty much. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I just think that there's so much capital flow out there. There are a lot of people who expect a less, lower, less return. Like you, I, let's say you're ex- expecting mid teen IRR. There could be uh-huh. someone there out there expecting 10% IRR and they could be the one who's paying that $1 million, right? And or maybe their underwriting is completely wrong, right? Compared to, I, I wouldn't say underwriting is wrong. I mean, I think a lot of people are... Well, you can say that, James. You don't have to be a nice person. You can say it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying that everybody think. I mean, they, absolutely, they could be underwriting wrong too. Uh, or they may be going over aggressively on the rent, rent uh, growth uh, assumption or property tax growth assumption compared to what you have. At the same time, they could have a much lower expectation on the oh yeah, return. I mean that's that's okay. let's let's hope that's the case because if they have a higher expectation, man, they're going to crash and burn. Okay, absolutely, absolutely. I hope. I really hope they have a low expectation. Yeah, yeah. I did look at a chart uh, recently from Marcus and Milicha between the four Texas city where they shows how there's like a San Antonio, Austin, Dallas, and Houston. And if you look at Dallas, you know the amount of acceleration in terms of growth is huge, right? And then suddenly it's it's coming down. I mean, all markets are coming down slightly uh, right now, but I'm just hopefully, you know, you can see that growth to continue in all these uh, strong markets. No, 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 don't get me wrong. When I said um, 
somebody paid more than 1 million just to get into best and final uh-huh. that has no merits on actually that is not a that is not a comment on the state of the dallas market i personally uh-huh. feel dallas is a fantastic market texas overall uh-huh. all the big four cities that you mentioned are fantastic uh-huh. but my point is there is nothing no asset in the world that is so great that you can pay an infinite price for it and there is nothing so bad in the world that if it wasn't for a cheap enough price you wouldn't want to buy it correct right? correct so, correct i mean that that's what i meant i didn't mean it was a comment on the state of the market mm mm-hmm, mm-hmm. got it got it so let's come to your search outside of the taxes market right yeah. so how did you choose how did you go to jacksonville well number one the deal is i didn't want to go to a smaller um, smaller city i'm not one of those guys okay. you know in search of yield i i i find everybody every time somebody tells me i'm looking for a higher cap rate mm-hmm. i was like why do you like to get shot every time you go to the apartment building do you want to go to the ghetto do you want somebody to stab you in the stomach is that because yeah. that's that's a lot of deals with higher cap rate yeah yeah there's a lot of because i was like man i can find you a lot of deals with really high cap rates yeah but you might get stabbed yeah right so yeah. and there's a lot of <laughs> other asset class too which has higher oh, cap yeah. rate Oh yeah yeah yeah. So I think people just do not know what a cap rate means or how Yeah and people you know all these gurus tell you that they, I mean let's not even get into that right. <laughs> so specifically for us like I wanted to stay in um, at least a secondary tertiary market but tertiary I meant like any city over at least 8 900,000 at least a million somewhere in that range right. Okay. And specifically look after Texas it was really Florida. Cuz look you could do the whole Atlanta thing I love personally I love Atlanta but it's a toss up between Atlanta and say either of the three metros in Florida or Jackson North and Central Florida Jacksonville Tampa Orlando I you know based on my institutional experience as doing this stuff portfolio management anyways uh-huh. I kind of ran a smaller little factor model for all the cities where I took in different sort of factors about 30 different factors uh-huh. and and then you know you kind of just have to do all the site tours and property visits and make all those relationships uh-huh. and what I was seeing across the board was I mean Tampa is a great market but for the same quality product for the same demographic of tenant uh-huh. for the same say uh, rent uh, level so Tampa was 20 to 25% more expensive on a per pound basis okay let's say Jacksonville right uh-huh. Orlando was kind of in the middle where the good deals were really expensive or rather the good areas were a bit too dear for us uh-huh. and the bad areas were nicely priced and everybody then tells you oh it's Florida right no, but what no. they don't tell you is there's good and bad parts in florida like yeah, sub market yeah yeah right so right. you got to go sub market by sub market and then lastly what we were basically seeing in jacksonville was uh, it was very much a market which it like for instance in atlanta and say even parts of say orlando and tampa you kind of have to go block by block street by street because if you're on the wrong side of the street man you are screwed mm-hmm. pretty much absolutely but absolutely. Uh, jacksonville to a certain degree obviously not always uh was very similar to dallas in the sense that there's good areas and then there's a gradual shift into a, a not as a fluent area uh-huh, uh-huh. right so basically what we you kind of had to do was nail the sub market properly and you had a higher chance of success than for instance nailing right down to the street corner uh-huh, uh-huh. right and then like i said the deals we were seeing the numbers just made more sense in jacksonville for okay. the same level of demographic for the same type of tenant for the same income level for the same vintage for the same type of construction mm. so jacksonville you know we started making relationships on all the markets but jacksonville is where we got the best bang for our buck and that's how we moved in there okay so i just want to give some education to the listeners so as as what omar and i was talking about not the whole city that you are listening to as as hot is hot right so for example you have to really look at the human capital growth in certain part of the city right so for example in dallas not everywhere in dallas is the best area to invest right you may have got a deal in dallas but are you buying in a place where there's a lot of growth happening right like for example north dallas is a lot of growth right compared oh, yeah. to south dallas right in atlanta there's i20 that runs in between atlanta and there's a difference between you cross the i20 is a much you know a lot of price per pound or price per door is like 100 over door and below atlanta is slightly lower right so it's it's a growing but in it may grow it may not grow i mean right now market is hot everything grows right you can buy anywhere and make money and you can claim that hey i'm making money but as i said market is, is it a repeatable tag my, my the way i look at it is hey is this a strategy repeatable can i Correct. just rinse and repeat this over and over and over again. correct correct i mean it depends on sponsors taste as well some sponsors yeah. will buy just because price per door is cheap right but do they look at the back end of it when the market turns right uh, some yeah, sponsor will be very very scared to buy that kind of deal because we always think about when what happened when the market turns right so yeah james and the other things i've seen is that 
um, look, obviously we're not buying the most highest quality product. Correct. But what I've seen is a lot of times when people focus on price per unit, they say, I want to go for the cheapest price per unit. Uh, well, there's a reason why it's cheap because, you know, there's a reason why a Suzuki is cheaper than a Mercedes. Now, I'm not saying you have to go buy a Mercedes uh -huh. because sometimes you need to do, you only need to buy a Suzuki, yeah. right? I mean, that's the way it is. But Correct. you kind of have to be cognizant that just because something is cheap doesn't mean it's more valuable. And just because something is more expensive doesn't mean it's less value. Correct, correct, correct. And price per door is one, I think, one of the most flawed metrics that people are talking about. Price per door and also how many doors do people own? And also cap rate, man. I <laughs> honestly, rate. I was like, you are right. Cap rate, price per door, and uh, what's How that? many doors do you have? How many doors do you have? These three, three metrics are so popular. You so much of, there's so much of marketing happening based on these three metrics. I mean, for me, you can take, take it and throw it into the dash bin, right? <laughs> it's trash. Yeah, and the way I look at it is I would much rather have one or two really nice things as opposed to 10 really crappy things. Correct, correct, correct. Like I don't mind buying a deal in Austin for 100 a dog compared oh, yeah. to buying a, buying a same deal in a strong market in another, like for example, North Atlanta, right? I would rather buy it in Austin. Just It's just different market, right? So oh, yeah. absolutely different. So price per door, number of doors, and cap rate, you know, especially entry cap rate, right? Even back-end cap rate, you can't really predict, right? So it's a bit hard to really predict all that. But that's Yeah, but my point is with all of these things, you are gonna, and when people tell me cap rate, I'm like, look, so are you buying stabilized properties? Because that's the only time you can apply this. Correct, correct. Otherwise, what you really kind of have to look at is how much upside do I have? Because at the end of the day, you know this better than I do. Correct. Regardless of what somebody says, what somebody does, everything is valued on comps. Correct. Pretty much. Mm -hmm. You can say it's a low cap rate and the broker will tell you, well, yeah, the guy down the street bought it for 150000 a unit, so you yeah. got to pay me 150, right? And then that's the end of the conversation. Yeah. <laughs> Literally, I mean, that is the end of the conversation, right? What are you going to do about it? Yeah, correct. I mean, the brokers, they have a fiduciary responsibility to market their product as much as possible. But I think it's our responsibility as sponsor to really underwrite that deal to make sure that oh, yeah. you know, what is the true potential. And look, to be honest with you, sometimes a deal... Mm -hmm. that is, say, at $150,000 a unit mm -hmm. might actually be a better deal oh, than absolutely. something that's at $50,000 a unit. I mean, you don't know till you don't run the numbers. Correct. Absolutely. Absolutely. I've seen deals which, uh, which uh, you know, 160 a door and still a much better deal than uh, something that, you know, I can buy for 50 a door, right? Yeah. So it's it's you have to underwrite all deals there's no such thing as cap rate or no such thing as price per door i mean you can use price per door to a certain level i right? just i mean but you can level. say so in this market what is the price per door mm -hmm. that's the extent of what you might potentially say in the sub market correct, hey, correct. all the comps are trading at 75000 door mm -hmm. why is this at 95 a door mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah I mean, that's it yeah, I, I like to look at price per door divide by um net square, rentable square footage because that would neutralize all measurements. Yeah, see, you know, we had a little back and forth on this. I was talking to my analyst on this, but mm -hmm. my point is that I would understand applies at least to my mind, okay? I'm not, because I know a lot of brokers use it. Sure. In my mind, that would apply to say commercial and industrial properties more. Mm -hmm. But anytime I've gone to buy, say, or rent an apartment complex, mm -hmm. I never really go and say like, hmm, the rent is $800, Mm -hmm. It's 800 square feet. Hmm. On a per square feet basis, I'm getting $1. Mm. And then I no, go no, no. I'm not talking about that measurement. I'm talking about a uh, price per door divided by square footage rentable because that would that would neutralize between you have like whether you have a lot of smaller units, whether you have a bit larger units and you have to look and but you have to plot it based on location. Right? Yeah, so, so you know, you, you get into those sort of issues, right? Well, yeah. is this corner worth more than that corner? Yeah, yeah. Hey, yeah, you're right. Yeah, you have to still do a rencoms and analyze it. Right? Yeah. So, like, so much I mean, look, I get it. Especially, I think it works if you know if you know one or two submarkets really well. Then mm -hmm. you can really... Correct, do. correct. That's like my market, I know price because I know the market pretty well. I'll just ask to these two information. Just tell me price per door, how much uh, average square feet on the units. Uh, then I can tell you very quickly because I know the market yeah. pretty well. Because yeah. you know your market, because you already know all the rents. You correct. already know all yeah, the sales. You're right, you're right. Yeah, you have, to, you have to know the rent. As I said, you have to build that database yeah. in your mind or in a spreadsheet to really underwrite things very quickly. So that's good. So let's go back to Jacksonville, right? So what are the top three things that you look at when you chose Jacksonville at a high level uh, in terms of like the macroeconomic uh, indicators? Oh, see, so I, was, I wasn't necessarily just looking at Jacksonville. What I did is I did a relative value comparison. Okay. It's like, what is, 
what is the relative value I get in Jacksonville versus the value, say, I get in a Tampa, Atlanta, or an Orlando, and okay. how does that relatively compare to each other? So how do you That's measure rel- how do you measure relative? So what, value? what I did is, for instance, for a similar type of say vintage, right? Mm-hmm. Say a mid eighties, mid seventies vintage, mm-hmm. and for a similar type of median income, which was giving me a similar type of rent, say okay. a median income of say a forty grand a year. Mm-hmm. or 38 to 40 grand a year, resulting in an average rent of about $800, right? Mm-hmm. And a vintage, say, mid-70s, mm-hmm. right? Wood construction. Mm-hmm. Now, what am I getting on a... And again, this is very basic math, right? This isn't... Right. I'm, not, I'm not trying to, like, make a... Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. model out of this, right? Mm-hmm. So the basic math is, okay, what is the price per unit I'm getting in, say, where I have a certain crime rating, I have a certain median income rating, mm-hmm. and I have a certain amount of growth rating. And by growth, I meant not just... The submarket growth, what I also meant is, say, are elementary schools nearby? Mm-hmm. Uh, are there shopping and amenities nearby? Is this transportation accessible? You know, one or two highways, that mm-hmm. sort of stuff, right? Mm-hmm. So for those types of similar things, in specific submarkets we had selected, because Jacksonville had three, mm-hmm. uh, Tampa had two, and Orlando had three, and Atlanta had four, right? Mm-hmm. What is the average price per unit I'm facing for similar type of demographics with a similar type of rent profile? Mm -hmm. The similar type of growth profile, I mean, you just plot them on a spreadsheet, right? Mm -hmm. And with a similar type of basically, you know, how they performed after 2008. And when I was looking at that, what I was looking at, again, is this precise? No, it's not a crystal ball. But these are just to wrap your head around a certain problem, right? You have to frame it a certain way. Okay. And what I was seeing across the board was that it all boiled down to when you take these things, because at the end of the day, all you're really concerned is what price am I getting this at, right? Mm-hmm, really. mm-hmm. Once you normalize for all the other things, right? Correct, correct. Right? And what I was seeing was just generally Jacksonville, the pricing was just, like I said, compared to Tampa, which by the way, is a fantastic market, mm-hmm. right? But pricing was just 15 to 20% below Tampa. Mm-hmm. I mean, Tampa pricing is just crazy. I mean, right now I can look at a flyer and tell you there's 60s and mid 70s vintages going for 130,000 or 120,000 a unit mm-hmm. in an area where the median income is 38 to 40 grand. <laughs> Why is that? I know it's look, one of this is that the state, Tampa is actually a very good market. Okay, let's uh-huh. be very honest. It's a very good market. Mm-hmm. It's a very hot market. Now, mm-hmm. People are willing to pay money for that, right? So hmm. now maybe I am not the one paying money for it, but there's obviously enough people out there that are taking that bet. So, no, but why is that? Is it because they hope that Tampa is going to grow? Because, well, yeah, that, are, well, if Tampa doesn't grow, they're all screwed, James. No, but are they <laughs> assuming that growth or are they seeing something that we are not seeing? Because if people are earning 30, 40,000 median household income and the amount of apartment price is that much. There could be some other metrics that they are seeing that they think. Well, yeah, Tampa's money. growth has been off the charts in the past few years, right? Okay. okay. So what, look, first of all, this is the obvious disclaimer is I don't know what I don't know, mm-hmm. right? So mm-hmm. I don't know what everybody else is looking at. Mm-hmm. But Tampa's growth has been off the charts. It, mm-hmm. There's a lot of development and redevelopment and all that stuff happening in the, sub, in, in the wider metro area. Mm-hmm. So people are underwriting five, six, seven, eight percent growth. Oh, okay. So the growth is being uh, no. The growth is very, look. The growth has been very high so far. Okay. My okay, got it. Underlying yeah. assumption is, uh, I go in with the assumption that the growth must be high. But as soon as I get it, the growth will go down. <laughs> <laughs> but why is that growth? I mean, is there any specific macroeconomic? Oh, yeah, yeah. There's this? first of all, there's a port there. Number one, the port in of Tampa. Tampa. Okay, you're talking okay. about Jacksonville or Tampa right now. No, I'm talking Tampa as well. Okay, Tampa. Jacksonville also has it, but Tampa also has it. Okay, right? got it, got it. Tampa is also fast becoming. Tampa and Orlando, by the way, are connected with this. What is it? I two or I four, whatever, whatever it's mm-hmm. connected mm-hmm. by. So correct. they're fast, like you know, San Antonio and Austin, how they're kind of converging correct, like this. Correct, converging. Tampa and Orlando are sort of converging like this. Oh, got, so, it, got it, got number it. Number one, number two, they have a very diversified uh, employment base. You know, all the typical medical, government, finance, healthcare, mm-hmm. all of that sort of stuff. Right. Got it. Got it. Logistics, this and that. And plus the deal is, man, they're also repositioning themselves mm-hmm. as a tourist destination and they've been very successful at it. Okay. Because there's lots of, you know, you have a nice beach. So, mm-hmm. you know, that kind of helps always, right? If you yeah, have a nice yeah. beach, correct, correct. Uh, really nice weather, mm-hmm. you know, so they're, they're really positioning it that way. And it also helps that you've got Disneyland, which is about 90 minutes away from you in Orlando. Correct. So you can kind of get some of that thing as well. You come to Tampa, you enjoy all the stuff here because Orlando relative to Tampa is not, I mean, outside of Disneyland, there's not a lot to do in Orlando. Mm-hmm. But yeah, Tampa has a lot of like nightlife and entertainment and all of that. Kind but of I also heard from someone saying that like Orlando, because it's a it's more of a central location of Florida and because it of all this of hurricane fun. and people are 
people are less worried about hurricane in the central because it you know it has less impact I mean, when people don't get a hurricane everybody okay. is, they're not going to be the people who get the hurricane other people get hurricanes not correct, us correct correct but that's not always the case but that's the assumption okay by stampa is is the same uh, case as well like you know because of I, I i don't know exactly how many hurricanes they've got but okay look okay. man they seem to be doing fine i mean if they received a hurricane <laughs> they seem to be doing very fine after a hurricane Okay, okay. So let's go to Jacksonville. That's a market that did not exist in the map of hotness of apartment. And recently, in the past three, four years, or maybe maybe more than that. I mean, you can tell me a lot more history than that. Why did it pop out as as a good market to invest as a on apartment? Well, because Jacksonville actually, the, we talked to the Chamber of Commerce actually about this, and the Chamber of Commerce has done a fantastic job mm-hmm. in attracting people. Number one, because first of all, Florida has no state income tax. What well, they've mm-hmm. also done is a very low, otherwise state, uh, a low or minimal tax environment. Plus what okay. they've also done is they've reconfigured their whole thing as a logistical center as well. So oh, they already had the military and people always used to say, oh, Tampa, Jackson's got a lot of military. Mm-hmm. But it turns out military is only 11% of the economy now. Okay, okay. So they've repositioned themselves as a leading healthcare uh, center provider, all that sort of stuff, Mayo Clinic has an offshoot there, by the way, just to let you know, it's the number one ranked uh, hospital. Oh, yeah. Mayo Clinic. Okay, okay. Yeah, we always Mayo wonder Clinic. what is Mayo Clinic, but now you clarified that, right? Because right, so Mayo that. Clinic is in Rochester, I think. Uh, one of my okay. wife's colleagues is there, actually. I think okay. it's in Rochester, Minnesota. It's one of the leading hospitals in the world. Okay, got and it. And now got they've it. actually had an offshoot in uh, basically Jacksonville, which is the number one ranked uh, mm-hmm. hospital in Florida. Mm-hmm. Uh, plus they've got a lot of good healthcare jobs they've got a, they've really repositioned themselves not only as a great port because the port of mm-hmm. Jacksonville is really good and they're really expanding that port so you know Shaib Khan the owner of Jacksonville Jaguars he's mm-hmm. man he's going crazy he's spending like 2 or 3 or 4 billion dollars redeveloping everything got on it, top got of it. that what they've done is because of their location because they're right i mean Georgia is about 90 minutes away southern Georgia mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right and now you have to go into basically Florida and basically go to the panhandle what they've also done is because of their port because of their transportation network and then proximity to the east coast they've repositioned themselves as a logistical center as well got it I, that's what i heard as a, as a one of the big uh, driver for jacksonville and i also heard about the opening of panama canal has given that option from like importing things from china you know, oh, yeah. it's much much faster to go through panama canal and go through jacksonville oh yeah which makes it because a very the, good I, the other center. port is the other port right after jacksonville and which by the way is also going through a big redevelopment okay. and vitalization is savannah georgia okay But yeah it's just not big enough and i think jacksonville some does something like i mean don't quote me on this but like 31% of all the cars that are imported into the US come through the Jacksonville port. So okay. there's a lot of activity there, right? Got it. Got it. And, but they've really done a good job. The, the government there has done a fantastic job in attracting all this talent and all these businesses. Okay. Okay. Got it. So let me recap on the process that you came to Jacksonville and going to the sub market. So you looked at a few big hot market for apartments and you look at similar characteristics for that sub market that mm-hmm. you wanted, right? Like for closer to school and you know, in a good location and you look at the the deals flow that you are getting from each of this of this market and then i mean from your assessment jacksonville has a good value that you can go and buy yeah. right now for that specific demographic of yeah. uh, of location i guess right yeah look i love atlanta as well i was actually in atlanta a few weeks ago looking at some uh-huh. touring some properties so uh-huh. that doesn't mean atlanta isn't good or say tampa or orlando isn't good uh-huh. we were just finding the best deals in jacksonville Okay, okay. So the approach you're taking is like basically looking at the market and and uh, shifting it to look for deals in specific location or sub market where you think there's a, a good value to be created rather than just oh, randomly yeah. looking at deals, right? Because I because mean, man, it doesn't really help you, right? If you really yeah. go crazy, if you try to randomly look at deals. Right? Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of a lot of people just look at deals, right? What where is the deal? What's the deal? And they start underwriting the deals, right? So. Oh, right. dude, I don't have that much free time, man. I have a son who's like 18 <laughs> months old, man. I'm gonna go. My wife is gonna leave me if I start underwriting every deal that comes across my desk. Yeah, <laughs> I don't do. I don't look at all the deals that yeah, come. Man, I'm gonna kill myself trying to do all that. Yeah, man, it's very surprising. I see a lot of people, especially on Facebook, posting. I mean, I get up in the morning and I see this at 1 a.m. Who loves to underwrite deals? And I'm like, dude, it's 1 a.m. Go get a beer, <laughs> man. Why are you underwriting a deal at 1 a.m., man? What's yeah, on? yeah. Yeah, I think some people think that you can open up a big funnel and make sure you, you know, out of that funnel you get one or two good deals, right? But also if you can get if you have experience enough, you can get a right funnel to make sure you only get quality 
quality data in so that whatever yeah. comes in a source more quality and my point is man why do you want to underwrite more deals why don't you underwrite want to underwrite the right deal and spend right. more time on that deal or that right. set of deals correct at the both because there's just so many transactions in the us man there's no way i can keep up man correct 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 so let's go to your underwriting jacksonville because i think that's important right so now yeah. you already select a few sub market in jacksonville yeah. right and then you start networking with brokers is that what you did yeah yeah but okay. you know with brokers also you kind of have to train them right because uh, what happened is every time oh, what are you looking at all that after all that jazz the wine and dining and all that stuff mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i had we had to train brokers say okay man here are only specific sub markets we're looking at so for instance okay. jacksonville mm-hmm. it was san jose san marcos it was the mm-hmm. beaches it was mandarin and orange park okay, okay? and argyle forest to a certain degree right mm-hmm. if it's anything outside of that unless i don't know it's like the deal of the century Mm-hmm. right literally somebody just handing it away mm-hmm. we don't want to look at it don't mm-hmm. waste my time but and invariably what the brokers will do it because it's their job they have to do it they'll send you deals from other sub markets because they want to sell mm-hmm. hey i think this is great you you love this yeah and you have to keep telling them hey man i'm really appreciative that you send me this stuff not interested mm-hmm. not interested so but what that does is you do this a few times and then the broker really remembers your name when a deal in your particular sub market does show up because mm-hmm. then you go to top of the pile correct because they know because that you asked for specifically for this right yeah. now, now they go because otherwise what yeah. exactly you know the deal right yeah. Yeah. so that's kind of what we did right so let's say they send a deal that matches your location so what is the next thing we look at so what i basically look at is what are the demographics median income has got to be at the minimum 38 to 40000 minimum what right. are the median household income median household income right okay, got it got it uh, has to and be why do you think median household income, income is important because look again this again this is rough math this, i didn't do a phd in coming up yeah. with this thing okay sure, sure, sure. go ahead now, right typically you know our bc value add everybody says bc but really everybody is doing c okay you can just, i think people just say b to sound nice right <laughs> <laughs> it's really c okay let's be honest right yeah. typically with a c if you're going to push rents within one or two years in, in these sub markets at least i don't know about other areas mm-hmm. you typically you want to push the rents to around $1000 a month mm-hmm. give or take mm-hmm. average rent i'm just talking very crude terms right sure, sure. which basically means that if you're pushing it to $1000 a month and the affordability index says it should be 33% mm-hmm. 1000 times 12 is 12 12 times 3 is 36 mm-hmm. so i just add an extra 2000 on top or 4000 on top just to give a margin of safety okay right it's very simple math right there's nothing correct. complex in it right correct because correct. my point is if you're in an area where the average income is 30000 man you can raise your rents all you like nobody's going to pay you mhm yeah yeah correct just I, so i think let me, let me clarify to the listeners right so basically when you rent to an apartment we basically look for 3x income right so yeah. that's what how it translate to the household income average household income and if you want to do a value add or where deals they have you have a margin of a buffer in upside yeah. and you're buying it lower than what the median household income that's basically upside that means you can find enough renters yeah to fill up that upside right yeah just, just to clarify to the listeners got yep. it so go ahead so 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 you basically look at median household income what is the next step do you look for then i basically look at crime um, um basically i i just i mean look there's going to be a level of crime what i'm really looking at is violent crime right that, violent that, crime okay how do you look for which tools to you use well you can go to crime map crime ratings you can subscribe to certain databases and they can give you neighborhood scout is one by the way okay okay you can use that and then on top of that because you it's harder to do this in florida uh, texas but you can do this in other states like florida georgia and all of that hmm. where for instance what you can do is see what the comps in the sub market are hmm. right and that kind of helps you in determining basically look if all the properties for a certain vintage around you have traded for a certain amount of money mm-hmm. then if something is up or below that there's got to be a compelling reason for that now mm-hmm. i'm not saying if it's above it's a bad reason and don't do it there's got to be a compelling reason now there might be actually a very good reason mm-hmm. right got it so you know that is that's like a rough idea and then basically i'm looking at rent upside basically mm-hmm. look at costar see what the average rent are for this property what are what is roughly the average rent upside and you can also secret shop by either going to the place cuz i have a few contacts in jacksonville and you can okay. also call those up right mm-hmm. again rough math kind of gives you hey do i send me 500 200 mm-hmm. and then basically see what is the amount of value at left cuz okay. for instance if all the units have been renovated which by the way happened yesterday yesterday mm-hmm. we came across a deal in jacksonville i know the broker mm-hmm. and 
I mean, he sent the email, just you know, the email blast out. Uh-huh. And basically, what we saw was the location was great. There's a lot of rent up. Supposedly, there's a rent upside. But when I called the guy up, because we, we we know each other, uh-huh. he's like, bro, all the units have been renovated. Uh-huh. There's maybe 50, 75. I know you, so I'm going to tell you. There's only 50, 75. So uh-huh. the price isn't going to be worth it. Yeah. And they'll ask you to do some weird stuff, right? Like go and add washer dryer, rent the washer dryer out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or charge for assigned parking, right? So yeah, I was like, well, if it's, it's so very easy, very small amount in terms of upside, right? So, My point is, if you, if you, if it was so easy, why don't you do it? Yeah, yeah, correct. <laughs> That's the way I look at it. Yeah, yeah. Usually, I mean, when I talk to the brokers, I will, I will know within the few seconds whether it's a good deal or not because they will, I, they'll be really excited if it matches what we are looking for, right? Especially yeah, for plus I think the other deal is if you develop a good relationship with brokers and they know what you're specifically looking for, good brokers can kind of, again, look, they have to sell, but they can also give you some guidance along the way. Correct, correct. Right, they can be like, look, bro, it doesn't really work for you, I think, mm-hmm. but I'm just going to be honest with you. And look, it's a, you still have to take it with a grain of salt, but it is what it is. Correct, correct. Okay. So look for rent upside by looking at rent comps. And you said in Texas, which is a non-disclosure state, it's hard to find sales comp. But yeah, but look, you states. know, if you're in a market, you kind of know what the people, who the people are doing deals, which mm-hmm. people are doing deals. Okay. And you're, even if you don't know it, say your property manager kind of knows it or your lender, loan, loan, uh, loan broker or lender knows kind of what deals have traded in the market. Mm-hmm. You can, I mean, you can pick up a phone and call some people, right? Maybe you don't get all the information, mm. but you, you can get, I mean, if you're in a sub market for some time, even in Texas, mm. you kind of know. Yeah, Come exactly. On, exactly. Know. Advertisement. Hey, audience and listeners, this is James Kandasamy. I would like to interrupt the podcast to make sure that you get the announcement that we just recently launched Chief Academy. The Chief Academy is an education arm of our portfolio where we want to make sure that we are able to educate others who are interested in this business. And we are so humbled to bring this academy because there's so much of requests from our listener base, from our investors list, from people that we interact on day-to-day basis because we have so much of knowledge to give out and we put this into a course and we are sharing that. So we're going to be launching a course to make sure that you are a successful operator, which is called A to Z multifamily mentoring program. And in this program, you're going to be learning how to be having a successful psychology, right? It's very important in your mindset. How are you going to raise money using syndication? How are you going to select markets? How are you going to analyze sub markets? It's very important. Real estate is so hyper local. You have to know how to analyze sub market. How do you find deals in this hot market? I mean, everybody says go and work with brokers. Everybody knows that doesn't work. Brokers are busy working with the more experienced people, right? So how do you penetrate into this market? How do you underwrite deals, right? How do you, you're gonna even have a workshop on how to underwrite deals as well. How do you do financing? What kind of deal structure that you can do? What are the negotiation terms that you can put into your contracts to make sure that your contract is a very well-written contract, protects yourself and make sure you win a deal? How do we do asset management? I mean, asset management is so key. That's where you make the most money for your investors. If you operate it right, it's, you buy it right, at the same time, you have to operate it right. And we're also going to be doing a lot of details into property management where you are going to know how to set up your own property management company, how to know what are the parameters to look at property management company. I mean, you may not be having your own property management company. You can always have a third-party property management company, but you have to know what questions to ask, what to look for in the financials, the third-party property management company will know that you really know your stuff and they're going to be starting to respect you. And we're going to also teach about construction management, right, which is a very important skill, especially when you do value add. And, you know, as I mentioned, this podcast is all about value add and that's where you make a lot of money in value add, multifamily investment and construction management plays a key role. So to know details about this program, which will be taught directly from... Shanti and I, in uh, directly on a, on a weekly basis, we're going to have this course done through uh, Zoom calls, which is going to be, you can listen to this call and you can ask questions directly to us from anywhere in the nation. So make sure you send me a mail, james at achieveinvestmentgroup.com. I repeat, james at achieveinvestmentgroup.com if you're interested in this course. And later on, we are going to be launching other courses as well, such as passive investing costs. I mean, I know I wrote a book on passive investing costs, but there's so much of other details that I want to make sure that 
I communicate to passive investors because we are the peak of the market. There's so much of FOMO going around, FOMO's fear of missing out. There's so many investors are just putting their money without knowing the real thing on, on the deal, right? So there's so many things that I want to make sure that I cover into that cost as well. And for others who just want to establish a relationship with us, get to know us, and be in our email list right, uh, to get our newsletter and any other blog communication, right? You can always send us a mail, james at achieveinvestmentgroup.com, james at achieveinvestmentgroup.com. I'm really good with my email, so make sure you send it out. And I think that's it. Let's go back to the continuation of the podcast. Thank you very much. So when do you start underwriting on your Excel sheet? Oh, bro, after I've done the property tour, because if these don't even pass this stuff, why, why even bother <laughs> underwriting? What am I going to do? Oh, really? So, okay. So, so well, you basically look at market. All these, my point is, if it passes all these filters and then I have a conversation, I talk to my property manager, I talk to the broker, I uh -huh. talk to my local contacts there. And if it's all a go, and these are all five-minute conversations or less. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. It's, it's not like two-hour long conversation. Okay. If it passes through all this filter, just do the property tour, man. Okay. So you basically... But what about the price? How do you determine whether the price they're asking well, is reasonable I mean, or not? Obviously, because I, I can do a rough math and compare it against the comps, right? Okay. Okay. Got it. Got it. But so again, you basically my do point back is, of napkin. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because my point is, why waste myself? Uh, because look, the price could make sense. Mm -hmm. the, the, all the broker's pictures we all know look fantastic. It looks like you're in like Beverly Hills. <laughs> you know, so the pictures, you know, are kind of misleading, right? <laughs> and the location might be really good, but hey, you might go there and realize, you know, the approach is really weird. Or for instance, okay. we were touring this one property mm. and man, 90% of, I think the residents were just hanging out at 12, 12 noon. Correct. Outside correct. smoking. At like, what wow. the hell is this? Right. So my point is some things you only know when you do tour a property, there's no amount of videos and photos because the broker isn't going to put a bad photo on yeah 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 and, and your excel spreadsheet isn't going to tell you that right you yeah so basically you know you have to go what about what else do you look for when you do a property tour other than people so, you know when i'm doing the property tour like obviously i'm taking a lot of notes i'm taking a lot of pictures a lot of times the broker will say one thing and then you kind of turn back around and ask the same question in a different way just to kind of see mm -hmm. but what i also like to do is i also like to tour the property tour on the property tour i like to have the current property manager mm -hmm. and look I'm not stupid enough to say that the broker hasn't coached the property manager. The broker mm -hmm. has obviously coached the property manager. That's his job. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times you'll realize that they haven't been coached enough. So if you ask the right questions <laughs> the right way, okay. you can get some level of information. Again, you have to verify everything. Yeah. And another trick I also figured out is uh, you should also try to talk to the maintenance guy and have him on the property tour. Yeah. And and then take these people aside so the broker can be with somebody else. You have to, you have, ideally you should tour with two people. So one guy takes care of the broker and you take care of the property manager or the other way around. Because okay. then you can isolate and ask questions, right? Mm. So especially if you take like say a maintenance guy mm -hmm. and you ask him, hey man, so what kind of CapEx do you think we should do? What do you think about the loot? A lot of times those people haven't been coached as much or Correct. at all. Correct. And, and to be honest with you, man, we're, we're, we're in a high trust society. Most most people aren't going to completely just lie to your face. They might lie a little bit, but yeah. people aren't going to say red is blue and blue is purple. Correct. You know, yeah, you can I mean, feel I, it. You know, when somebody says it, you can, you can feel it. Come on. You can feel, yeah, that's what I'm coming. You can at least see whether they are trying to hide stuff or not, yeah. right? But you're right. Asking the maintenance guy is a better way than asking the property managers. Or even the other person is uh, like leasing agent who yeah. were assigned to you they probably will tell you a lot more information. And that's why I feel like uh, it's better to have two people, uh, like you and a partner touring. Okay. Because then different people, like one, because of, look, and there's nothing wrong. The broker has to do this. The broker always wants to be with you to see every question is answered the way he wants it to be answered. Mm. So then one of your partners or you can tackle the broker and the other person can tackle somebody else. Mm. Got it. Got it. So let's go to, okay. So now you are done with the property tour. Now you're going to an Excel spread underwriting, right? So how do you underwrite? I mean, I want to talk specifically about Jacksonville, right? Because it's a new market for you when you are looking at it new. How did you underwrite taxes, insurance, and payroll? Because this is- Taxes like was very easy to do. You talk to a tax consultant and you also see what uh, historically the rate has been for the county. Okay. Right? 
but again using your just because you're new doesn't mean you don't know people correct but how do you underwrite tax post acquisition because i mean i know in taxes is always very no, county but taxes is harder right but, but but in florida it's easier you, you, because the sale is reported they already know what price it is so how many percent do they increase it to after typically sales? in duval county where we bought it's about 80 to 85 percent of the sales okay okay that's but the tax rate is lower right just to give you an idea the tax rate is lower whereas in texas the tax rate is higher so you understand there's lots of things and for instance in florida there's an early payment discount so oh. if you pay in november so it's november december january february right so if you pay in november which is 4 months before you should be paying you get 4% off your tax return whoa that's really good <laughs> right so if you pay in december you get 3% off if you pay in january you get well, whatever 2% off in february you get 1% off so what's the average tax rate in uh, in florida so i don't know about florida i know about duval it was like okay, 1481 Wow, that's pretty low. Yeah, compared to yeah, but Texas, you also right? have to realize that the percentage of assessed value is higher, right? Mm. Depending on which county you're, you're in, you're in San Antonio and Austin, where Bayer County is just crazy. Bayer and Travis County, yeah. Yeah, Bayer and Travis are just crazy. But there are other counties in, for instance, uh, Texas, where the tax might be high, but percentage of assessed value is really low. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Correct. So I mean, it balances out, right? My point is. It? Yeah. So, but what about the? Do you get to protest the tax and all that in in, in the Duval County, in Jackson? I, I think you can. No, you were not. I think I know you can because we're going to do it. But but you need to have a pretty good reason, right? Okay. Okay. Right. So and obviously, look, you can show that. Yeah. Look, I bought it for this price, but my income doesn't support this tax or this or that. I mean, you have to hire the right people. I'm not going to go okay. stand and do it myself. Got but it. But yeah, it, you can it. do it. Easy. So easy. basically, they do bump up the price after acquisition, but it's yeah, very easy to determine that, and it's eighty to eighty-five percent or whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. That's, uh, but that's look, good. man, on the flip side is, then when you go in, you kind of have a better control of your taxes in Texas, where taxes can just go up, and you have yeah, no yeah, you can't, yeah, you have no control in Texas. So we usually go very, very conservative to a hundred percent. So which yeah, but look, my point is, it's good and bad, right? It depends yeah. where you are. So now people will say, oh, the tax person knows all your numbers. I'm like, yeah, but I can plan for it. Yes, yes, correct. But it also gives you an expectation difference between buyer and seller because the buyer is saying this is my cap rate, whereas the seller is saying this is what my, I mean, the buy, the seller is going to say this is what my cap rate, whereas the buyer is going to say this is my cap rate will be after acquisition because. Yeah, of course. So when, it, when it's smaller delta between these two, the expectation is, is more aligned compared to in Texas because, you know, it can jump up a lot and there's a lot of mismatch of expectation. Right. Yeah, so. There's actually a deal in Houston. It's near Sugarland. Mm-hmm. And yesterday I was talking to this guy who wanted me on the deal. Mm-hmm. And yeah, their deal isn't going anywhere because the taxes were reassessed at double Correct. last year's. Yeah. And now he has to go this the next week to fight it. Yeah. And there's no way you're gonna get double taxes in Florida or Georgia where there is a disclosure state, right? Correct, correct, correct. So that's a good part because the buyer would be saying that's not my the seller would be saying that's not my problem and that's <laughs> Buyer is going to say, I have to underwrite that, right? So it's, yeah, I mean, it's and then you can have a good case, right? Because it's not like somebody saying something You're like, look, man, this is the law. Yeah, correct. You know? <laughs> so let's go back to insurance. How do you underwrite Jacksonville insurance? Because I know in, in Florida, there's a lot of hurricane and all that. Yeah, but I'm see, not that's a myth, Jacksonville. man. Just to give you an idea, that is a complete myth because Jacksonville has only had one hurricane in the past 80 years. So is it lower than other part of Florida or just... Yeah, so it, first of all, it depends where you are in Florida, number okay. one, right? Mm-hmm. Number two, it depends if you're in a floodplain or not, but that's in Texas as well, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And number three, it also depends a lot of times, well, how many other claims have happened in your area, right? Because that kind of, for the insurance people, that's kind of like, a, mm-hmm. you know, how risky your area is, quote unquote, for them. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so in Jacksonville, um, and apparently... I did not need to know this information, but we were told this information. Okay. okay. That uh, the coast of Florida, where Jacksonville is, the Gulf Coast is really warm, where Jacksonville is, not Gulf Coast, it's on the other side, it's the Pacific, Atlantic side. These are really warm waters, relatively yeah. speaking. So apparently, there's like some weather system which makes it really hard for hurricanes to come into Jacksonville. Hmm. So that's why it's only had one hurricane in 80 years. So when you get your insurance code, when you compare that to other parts of Oh, yeah, Tampa you... was way higher, man. What about like Houston and Dallas? I, I don't know about Houston because I haven't really lately looked at something in Houston. Okay. Right. So I can't really say about Houston. Mm-hmm. And Dallas was um, maybe like say $25, $50 less, maybe. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, it wasn't. It, it wasn't because that was a big question that came up for everybody. I was like, look, man, literally, here's all the information. And you don't even have to take my word for it because I'm giving you sources for all the information. 
Okay. Right? So and that's what the they pay. insurance rate at different markets? Sorry? Are you talking about the insurance rate for yeah, yeah, markets? Yeah, 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 yeah. Because a lot of guys from Chicago, I had a few investors, they were like, well, Florida has really hurricanes. I was like, yeah, but Jacksonville doesn't. Okay, got it. So you basically got a quote from the insurance guy for... for oh, yeah, man, I wasn't just going to go in and just put my, my own number that has no yeah. basis in reality. Correct, 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 correct. So what about payroll? How did you determine the payroll? So the payroll is pretty easy, man. You know how much people get paid on per, per whatever hour. You know, you kind of have a rough idea how many people you're going to put on site and then you know what the load is. Mm-hmm. So then you can, it's pretty easy to calculate what your payroll is going to be. What was the load that you put in? So the load uh, in this particular case was like 40%, which is very high. Okay. But yeah, that's pretty high. Per, yeah, it is pretty high. It but is, they're per, pretty high. It's very high. <laughs> no, no, no. But hold on. Their per hour wage is really low, right? Oh, so really? Okay. Net, net, I was roughly around, I was paying roughly the same that I was paying in Dallas. Really? So yeah. why is that market pay per hour? I have no idea, man. And I, I tried to check. I asked multiple people. We did uh-huh. all that song and dancing. It's all kind of the same. So you looked at the current financials and look at the payroll. No, no, no. I was talking about my payroll would be going forward. I don't really okay, care what it. the guy before me paid. Why do I okay, care about it? that? So you got that from your property management company? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I verified it with other property managers and blah, 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 blah. Got it. Checked everything, you know, did all their due diligence. Got it, got it, got it, got it. Yeah, it's interesting that because uh, 40% is really high i mean usually yeah but your per per, per hour basis was really low like people's salaries are really lower Hmm. is that a jacksonville specific i don't know what it is specifically i think it's a florida based thing relatively speaking huh Uh, but yeah that's what i thought it was kind of weird too but then i made i checked with other people so the deal that you're doing i presume is a value add deal is that right oh yeah yeah yeah. all of these how deep is the value add i mean roughly at high level how much are you putting nothing had been touched for 10 years in fact let's put it this way we have enough land we checked with the city that we have enough land at the back to develop 32 more units Uh, that's really good because it's hard to find deals now you know like 10 years not touched right now all deals are being flipped right now right so within a couple of years so that's good that should be a really good deal and what was the percent we could do basically what was your expense ratio that you see based on income divided by your expenses? I mean, so first the, year. Of, hold second, on, man. Let me just take it out. I don't even have to tell you. Hold on. <laughs> okay. Why are you going to bother? You know, like, hold on. Because usually like, like 50 to 55% is, is common in the apartment industry. In Texas. Oh, no. In, in basically in Jacksonville, you can get really lower expense ratios. Also. Okay. It okay. depends with some market. Actually, I shouldn't say Yeah. That. Yeah. And I know like in... Um, Phoenix, I think it was like 45 or even 40 percent. It was surprising to me. Okay, so let me do you. this right now. Let me open this model. I can tell you right now. I don't want to give yeah. you some number, and then yeah, sure. invariably one person's going to be like, "I looked at your deal. Your number is two percent off." And like, yeah, I'm sorry. I don't like have like numbers with second decimal point. Sure, you know, because sure. people always do that to try to catch you, right? And you're like, "Yeah, it's off by like two dollars, man." <laughs> <laughs> So hold on. Oh yeah. So it was operating at 52 and okay. oh, yeah. First year we're going to be at 56 because just because you know, we're repositioning. Yeah, first year, first year, of course it will be higher. Because and then we just go down. Okay. That's interesting. That's good. So as the income grows, you know, and your expenses stabilize, I think you know, that expense ratio should be. That's, that, that's the only reason why the expense ratio goes down, right? Because you're yeah. basically, your top line growth is way higher than uh, your basically your expense growth. Mm, got it. Got it. Got it. Okay, that's really good. And you look for mid teens, uh, IRR. Mid teens, IRR, 8 to 10% yep. cash flow unstabilized, all that jazz. Got it, got it, got it. Okay, that sounds good in terms of the underwriting. So, have I given you all my secrets, James? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, very specific to Jacksonville, right? I like to see you know, how each market is being underwritten and so that the mm-hmm. business can learn. And uh, you know, it's very specific to people who do a lot of analysis on the market because I think that's important, right? You can't oh, just yeah. go and buy any deal out of the gate right there, right? So it's yeah. important to know that. And these three things like payroll, insurance, and taxes are very tricky when you're oh, yeah. in different, different markets. So yeah. it's good to understand how does the, that county or that particular city or a state uh, determines their property taxes because mm-hmm. we have different things in taxes here where I buy. Yeah. So it's good to understand. That's good. What is the most valuable value add that you think that you're going to be doing to this deal? Oh, well, look, man, because uh, nothing had been touched. I think everything is valuable. <laughs> okay. so we, look, hold on, but that we lucked out also, right? There's, look, okay. part of this is work and preparation, uh-huh. developing, but part of this is luck also. I mean, you yeah. can't just take that portion away, right? Oh, you yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's all my hard work. 
Yeah, right? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, because there's lots of people find, who work hard. It's really hard to find that kind of deals nowadays, right? Yeah. So, so let, how much how much was your rehab budget? So rehab is about a million dollars. A million dollars. So let's say your million dollar today become five hundred thousand, right? I'm sure a million dollar you're doing interior, exterior, everything upgrade, right? So let's say so that interior exterior is roughly split seventy thirty. Interior okay. seventy, exterior is thirty. Okay. Okay. So between interior and exterior, what, which one do you think is more important? I think uh, if you if you only had a few dollars, exterior. Exterior, okay. Yeah, because people make a... F- Again, this doesn't mean you should ignore interiors. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> this is, that's a disclaimer. The point is, this is... My point is, a lot of times, we as humans make decisions on first impressions. Mm-hmm. So if you come into a property and the clubhouse looks great, the approach looks great, the trees are trimmed, the parking lot is done nicely... Mm-hmm. Then you go into a, an apartment, which may, I mean, I'm not saying it should be a complete disaster, but it might not be the best apartment in the world. Mm-hmm. You can overcome that, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. But if you come in and the approach looks like, you know, somebody got murdered here, right? And the clubhouse looks like, you know, fights happen here, mm-hmm. right? Then no, how, no matter how good your interior renovation is, some there's a good chance people will say, well, I mean, it looks like I might get killed to just get into my apartment. Yeah. Right. So it's a first impression thing more than anything else. It's like any other thing in life, I feel. Absolutely. So let's say you're 300,000 for exterior, right? Uh, let's say that 300,000 become 150,000. What are the important exterior renovation that you would focus on? So we did all the tree trimming because, man, there's, first of all, living in Texas, <laughs> I didn't realize how much I missed trees till I saw them again, right? Oh, yeah. So first of all, tree trimming. Trees hadn't been trimmed for 10 years, man. They were beautiful Spanish moss, uh, Span- oak trees with Spanish moss on them, but they just hadn't been trimmed. Okay. Right? Okay. So doing all the tree trimming, all the landscaping, uh, then basically um, reseeding the driveway mm-hmm. and then making sure all the flower beds and uh, all the approach leading up to all of that was done properly and the monument signage. Okay, got it. So this is what you would focus on. Yeah, and what so about we're also the- putting a dog park, by the way. Oh, but cool. uh, you said if my three hundred thousand dollar budget went to one fifty, what would I do? And that's what yeah, I'm- dog park is not very expensive. That should be pretty- yeah. But I'm saying it's stuff like dog park, add yeah, a little that- more color to your outdoor kitchen, your swimming pool, your put a bigger sign, you know, you know that sort of stuff. Correct. Yeah, and dog park is one of the most valuable value add because you spend less on it, but a lot of people want it. Right. Yeah. So for some reason, I mean, for people like pets and all that. So what yeah. about on the interior? You have 700,000. How much per door are you planning to put for it? So roughly say I can do the math. Roughly it was six mm-hmm. something. Right. So go. Mm-hmm. Do I buy? Yeah. So we're not even, so we're, we're planning on doing roughly say 75% of the units. Mm-hmm. Right. So I think that's 104 units. If you go 700 mm-hmm. divided by 104, roughly we were going to be around $6,500. Okay. Per unit. That's a, yeah. uh, pretty large budget so yeah oh you, man you should see some of these units man i was like why god how do people even live here yeah because yeah, it's a very yeah. affluent i mean relatively a middle class upper middle class sub market right so mm. the owner just hadn't done anything so are you going to be using the property management company to do the uh yeah, they have a very fantastic reputation and they were okay. highly recommended and a few of our other contacts also use them okay. so that's why because okay, we were okay. seeing okay. problems uh, with a lot of other people's property managers uh-huh mm-hmm. Um, either they didn't have the right staff or they didn't have the right professionals and this and that. And they, these guys were properly integrated across the value chain. So at a high level, what are you doing on the interiors? High level interiors, it's, it's, it's a typical two-tone paints, mm-hmm. backsplashes, change the kitchen mm-hmm. appliances, countertops, medicine cabinets, uh, lighting mm-hmm. packages. Mm-hmm. The other small little thing which we realized was a very big value add but was cost us less than $2.50 mm. per you. <laughs> Per outlet was the USB USB outlet. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, that was the biggest value add. Yeah, yeah, biggest value add. That that is the most valuable value add, right? (laughs) Yeah. Like I'd never done it in any of my properties, but I was telling my wife Shanti and I said, hey, you know, we should do these, you know, because it's so cheap and a lot of people... And it was like like, $2 or whatever, even cheaper than that. And people people cannot get over the fact that they have so many USB outlets. I was like, everywhere there's a plug, there's got to be a USB outlet. So do you put for every outlet? The USB well, not for every, I was dramatizing, but I mean, for the <laughs> ones that are accessible, say around the kitchen, living room. Okay. Uh, 
interesting i should steal that idea you know so and put oh, it i didn't invent the idea go for it man <laughs> yeah i think you must be poor to take it <laughs> i know a few other people who i interviewed mentioned yeah. that too but he, I, i'm not sure for some reason we are not doing it but I, that should be a very people simple. love it man and i don't blame them man like it's freaking aggravating sometimes you know when you got to put like a little thing on top of your usb and then you plug it in yeah yeah imagine how much uh, you know this life has changed around all this electronic devices oh, yeah. right with the iot devices and all that right so interesting so did you get a lot of advice from your property management companies on how to what kind of what are the things to renovate and all that or how did yes you- and no because we had been developing a relationship with them 6 months prior to this acquisition uh-huh. so we had a good relationship with not just them but with other vendors in the market and it's been, yeah. and luckily for us the regional we have for this property right now uh-huh. actually in an earlier life and with an earlier uh, employer had actually started working on this asset 15 years ago as a property oh, manager this is sheer dumb luck this is not by design yeah so yeah. she really knew where all the bodies were buried yeah yeah that's so interesting that sometimes you get people who have been in the industry for some time they say yeah i've worked on that property before this which is good for us right because they know yeah. got it got it so let's go to a more personal side of things right so So you have been pretty successful now and uh, you are doing you know apartment syndication now and all that right so why do you do what do you do James I know a lot of people try to say they have a big why and they have a really philosophical reason James mm-hmm. my big why is James I really like I my lifestyle is very expensive James so all these nice suits okay all these nice vacations man they're not cheap okay okay real estate is a pretty good way to make a lot of money man okay so i want to give you a philosophical reason i know a lot of people say they have the immigrant <laughs> success story oh i came from india or i came from pakistan i ate out of a dumpster i worked in a gas station and no i had like dollars in my pocket and everybody tells me that and i say okay what what did you do man did you did you i don't know did you swim from india you had 2 dollars in your pocket you need to get on a plane buddy you can't be here no, right with that money no, indian shows up to america uneducated <laughs> I mean, are you kidding me? All the Indians are educated. Everybody's an engineer, a doctor, a lawyer. Are you kidding me? He shows up with five dollars, man. So no, I didn't. I didn't show up to this country with five dollars, James. I didn't eat out of a dumpster. I didn't uh-huh. work at a gas station, and I'm very grateful for that. Mm-hmm. Right? I've always had a very good lifestyle, uh-huh. and I don't need to have a philosophical reason to say I'm doing this to yeah, I don't know solve world hunger or poverty or whatever. Uh-huh. No, uh-huh. I have a pretty good lifestyle. I'm very grateful. I'm very blessed. Mm-hmm. and the biggest thing in my life has been that look i moved to texas man i didn't know anybody mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. but people have been so generous people have been so kind in not just say investing with us which is very nice mm-hmm. which is i'm very grateful for that but also connecting me with other people right mm-hmm. hey hey just opening a door they don't they didn't have to do it but people have been so generous and so kind yeah so i quite enjoy the fact man that it's a good way to it's a good way to make an honest living mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. i have a very expensive lifestyle Uh-huh. that it needs to get financed mm. and that's just the way it is it's awesome and i didn't show up with 2 dollars in my pocket so i'm very good <laughs> hey, that sounds good so do you have any daily habits that you think makes you more successful yeah man life? i just get up every day and i try to put one step after the other but okay. consistently work in the same direction so every day i'm reaching out to people and uh-huh. it's a lot of small little tasks first of all um I I never like getting up early but I I I I've always known the value of getting up early so I get up in the morning mm-hmm. right 5:45 at 5:50ish I'm trying to up most days not always right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I I read a lot of books man I reach out to brokers all the time I'm always looking at deals coordinating with my team to do stuff and a lot of these like you do in your business there's a lot of small little tasks no no mm-hmm. there's no one task that is oh my god you do this and everything oh, yeah. works but it's just small little tasks that you do daily every single day day in and day out mm, mm. so even if you're feeling sick even if your head is hurting you just do it man I mean, so g- can you give is. a f- few uh advice to people who want to start in this business regularly communicating so in my particular case i don't know like when you're starting out specifically mm-hmm. everybody has a different pain point right so in my particular case for instance on a daily i can't say but weekly i can tell you staying mm-hmm. in touch with my marketing people mm-hmm. emailing brokers emailing investors following up with people i've had conversations with especially leads you know people introduce mm-hmm. stuff a lot of mm-hmm. word of mouth mm-hmm. and just doing the stuff over and over and over again but it's not like i have a 9 to 5 now right it's not like oh friday i'm done and saturday sunday i'm relaxing uh-huh. i mean i could relax on a monday now but saturday and sunday i'm working 
right? So mm. that that's okay. But it's like the same with you are doing with your business, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, Omar, it has been really a pleasure to have you on this podcast. Is there anything that you have never mentioned in other podcasts that you want to mention? Oh, no, James, podcast? I don't want to go down that road, man. <laughs> <laughs> Is there something that you want to tell, you know, people who listen to you that you think that would be a good thing that to talk yeah, about? Yeah, what I want to tell people, look, there is, I don't think you should take words of wisdom from me, but yeah. what I should tell people is, guys, honestly, I don't listen to a lot of gurus. I would highly suggest that you don't attend any boot camps, okay? Mm-hmm. Please, if you have an education, anything above a high school level, please, instead of paying some joker on the internet, uh, $25,000, because he's going to become your mentor, he himself doesn't do any deals to begin with, Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's most of better, them don't do deals. Right? They yeah, just sign other all, people deals and claim the numbers. Yeah, it's very easy to basically say, I'm an educator, I'm a mentor. I feel like uh, these days, anybody who couldn't get a real job or doesn't have a career is certainly a life coach, right? <laughs> or they're doing coaching or a mentor, right? Okay. Instead of that, you don't want, you hear all these people on podcasts. You're hearing James. You hear all the other guests that he interviews and other people, right? Correct, it's a correct. lot better for you to reach out to a guy like James or me, for instance, for that matter, mm-hmm. or especially James, because he's he has a track record, then to pay sure, some sure. jackass mentor or guru $25,000, $30,000. Guys, honestly, if you want to burn your money, just send it to me and James. We'll have a way better time than 25, 30 grand than some mentor yeah. who has no idea what he's doing. Yeah. There's so much of knowledge base nowadays, right? I mean, if you really want to do something, you can definitely do it. You just have to really, really want it. Yeah, don't, don't pay some scammy guy on the internet twenty five, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. You know, yeah. pay it to us. We're way better people. <laughs> awesome, awesome. All right. Um, yeah, if you guys want to join us in Multifamily Investors Group in Facebook, there's so much of discussions there, so much of data that's being shared. You can learn a lot of things too from there. And I think that's it. Omar, thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much for hey, having me. Before man. I forget, uh, let everybody know how people should be able to reach you. Oh, yeah. I thought you'd never ask me, James. No, no, sure. Absolutely. Go okay, for so it. you can reach me, Omar, O-M-A-R, at boardwalkwealth.com. Guys, you can also go on to our webpage, boardwalkwealth.com. And I made it super simple for people, okay? Anybody, even a dummy can do it. Type your name, type your email address, and say how you heard about us, and press submit. That's it. You don't got to do anything else. We'll get in touch with you. All right. Thanks, Omar. Thanks for being on the show. Take it easy, sir. Have a good one. Advertisement. Hey, audience and listeners, this is James Kandasamy. I would like to interrupt the podcast to make sure that you get the announcement that we just recently launched Achieve Academy. Achieve Academy is an education arm of our portfolio where we want to make sure that we are able to educate others who are interested in this business. And we are so humbled to bring this academy because there's so much of requests from our listener base, from our investors list, from people that we interact on day-to-day basis because we have so much of knowledge to give out and we put this into a course and we are sharing that. So we're going to be launching a course to make sure that you are a successful operator, which is called A to Z Multifamily Mentoring Program. And in this program, you're going to be learning how to be having a successful psychology, right? It's very important in your mindset. How are you going to raise money using syndication? How are you going to select markets? How are you going to analyze sub-markets? It's very important. Real estate is so hyper-local. You have to know how to analyze sub-markets. How do you find deals in this hot market? I mean, everybody says go and work with brokers. Everybody knows that doesn't work. Brokers are busy working with the more experienced people, right? So how do you penetrate into this market? How do you underwrite deals, right? How do you, you're going to even have a workshop on how to underwrite deals as well. How do you do financing? What kind of deal structure that you can do? What are the negotiation terms that you can put into your contracts to make sure that your contract is a very well-written contract, protects yourself and make sure you win a deal? How do we do asset management? I mean, asset management is so key. That's where you make the most money for your investors. If you operate it right, it's, you buy it right, at the same time, you have to operate it right. And we're also going to be doing a lot of details into property management where you are going to know how to set up your own property management company, how to know what are the parameters to look at property management company. I mean, you may not be having your own property management company. You can always have a third-party property management company, but you have to know what questions to ask, what to look for in the financials, the third-party property management company will know that you really know your stuff and they're going to be starting to respect you. And we're going to also teach about construction management, right, which is a very important 
skill, especially when you do value add. And you know, as I mentioned, this podcast is all about value add, and that's where you make a lot of money in value add, multifamily investment, and construction management plays a key role. So, to know details about this program, which will be taught directly from Shanti and I, in uh, directly on a on a weekly basis, we're going to have this course done through uh, Zoom calls, which is going to be you can listen to this call and you can ask questions directly to us from anywhere in the nation. So make sure you send me a mail, james at achieveinvestmentgroup.com. I repeat, james at achieveinvestmentgroup.com if you're interested in this course. And later on, we are going to be launching other courses as well, such as passive investing course. I mean, I know I wrote a book on passive investing course, but there's so much of other details that I want to make sure that I communicate to passive investors because we are at the peak of the market. There's so much of FOMO going around, FOMO fear of missing out. There's so many investors are just putting their money without knowing the real thing on on the deal, right? So there's so many things that I want to make sure that I cover into that course as well. And for others who just want to establish a relationship with us, get to know us, and be in our email list right, uh, to get our newsletter and any other blog communication, right? You can always send us a mail, james at achieveinvestmentgroup.com, james at achieveinvestmentgroup.com. I'm really good with my email, so make sure you send it out. And I think that's it. Let's go back to the continuation of the podcast. Thank you very much. That's it for this episode. If you'd like to learn even more, check out James's free audiobook. It's the audio version of his best selling book on passive investing. You can get the audiobook completely free, along with other valuable resources, by visiting www.achieveinvestmentgroup.com forward slash free audiobook. Also, be sure to join our Facebook group too. To find it, just do a Facebook search for Multifamily Investors Group. Thanks for listening. Join us again for another episode next week. See you then.